notice about that. And I'm delighted to welcome, every, welcome everyone to the last talk in the series that was organized at Trinity College this fall um, as part of a new course on nature and brain health. And the series is titled Olmsted's Brain, Discovering Health in Urban Places and Wild Spaces. And the series was organized um, in honor of the 200th birthday of Frederick Law Olmsted, who was born in Hartford and is buried in Hartford. And we're fortunate to have some Olmsted design parks and landscapes um, in this area. And also in response to um, the pandemic where a lot of people were really appreciating the opportunity to be outside in nature and um, you know, learn to love the place that we live um, even more than we already did. And um, as a neuroscientist, I'm very aware of um, the need to support brain health and have gotten increasingly interested in the benefits of nature for brain health. So for this series, we've been talking about um, the history behind um, the concept of nature and brain health, talked about some public policies, talked about some research related to this, um, forest bathing and recent research that was done during the pandemic. And the final capstone to this series is this talk today um, that we have um, on why we need new national parks. And I'm very um, honored and delighted today to present Michael Kellett, um, who's someone that I've learned a lot from over the past few years in trying to understand public policies related to natural spaces and public land. And um, what I'd like to do now um, is invite everyone to please mute yourself. Um, there will be time for questions at the end. You're welcome to type questions in the chat. And I would also like to um, invite my student, Dorothy Annika, to formally introduce Michael Kellett. Dorothy? Thank you, Professor. Hello, everyone. Today we welcome Michael Kellett. Michael Kellett has more than 30 years of experience advocating for national parks, wilderness, free flowing rivers, and wildlife. He is the founder and executive director of Restore, the North Woods, and he has visited more than 250 national parks. The national park system is open to everyone and helps fight climate change prevent the loss of wildlife species and provide vital public green space. In 2021, after a year of pandemic restrictions, record numbers of people flocked to America's national parks. Yet we have barely increased parkland accretions since the 1990s and our existing parks are underfunded and often crowded. America's national parks are a haven for native wildlife, clean air and water, geological wonders, intact ecosystems and historic sites. They are also engines of economic activity and sources of local and national pride. Given the value of national parks to individual and community well-being, as well as their importance to our national heritage, adding new national park units and expanding many other areas can help to fully protect the values for which they were established. On that note, welcome Dr. Mr. Kellett, and we are delighted to hear your presentation titled why we need more and new national parks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for tuning in and I uh, appreciate you listening to me for a little while and then I hopefully will have a lot of time for questions and discussion. I thought I would um, just dive in since I've had that glowing review of my history. I won't go into any more, but I, I thought I'd dive into a PowerPoint presentation for folks and uh, to give you sort of the overview of what we're talking about. So can I, is, am I able to share screen? Yep, you should be able to share. Let's see. I don't see where to hmm. do it. Okay, hang on. I need to be a can, can, you, can you see it? 
Yes, yeah, there we go. Okay, super. Okay. And just give me a second here. Okay, can you see that okay? Looks great. Good. Okay, well, um, why we need more national parks? Here's um, a good example. Here's Moosehead Lake in Maine. Uh, there's a little strip around a lot of the shore that's in some kind of public or conservation ownership, but all the lands around it are pretty much unprotected. Uh, it's this beautiful, huge lake that's still pretty wild and uh, it's, it really doesn't have much protection. Um, on the other hand, You've probably seen the headlines in, uh, in the news, national parks love to death by crowding crowds of people and so forth. And there's some truth in that certainly, at, especially in certain parks, uh, they're getting a record breaking visitation. The parks get about 300 million visitors a year, which is almost the equivalent to the whole population of the US. Uh, it was down a little bit in 2020 for obvious reasons, but it's now it's jumped back up in 2021. And that's a great thing. It's good that people are going to parks, but the problem is they're not well distributed. Over 90% of the acreage is west of the Great Plains. A lot of it is in Alaska, so it's not accessible to most people in the country or easily accessible. In New England, Acadia is the only full new national park and it's one of the smallest parks. And it's also one of the more heavily visited parks. Uh, and despite this problem, uh, you see there's Acadia in the photo there. There's a typical uh, crowded day. Um, and the park system has barely grown since the 1990s in acreage. So it really, we have not, as visitation has gone up, we've not addressed this issue. So an obvious solution when you have excess demand is to increase the supply. And so we need to create more national parks. Here's the White Mountains National Forest, uh, which is a proposed national park, which would give it much more protection than it has right now. And it certainly deserves park status. Um, so uh, there are a number of reasons why national parks are beneficial. One of them is uh, as Susan talked about, for people, um, if we expand the parks, we'll help to take the pressure off our existing parks, um, bring parks to people in places where there aren't very many, like the Northeast and the South and the Midwest. Most major cities don't have a national park anywhere close to them. Uh, it would, and it would shorten trips to parks, which most people don't talk about much, but if you didn't, if some, if we didn't have so many people flying far away to national parks, we wouldn't be burning up as much fossil fuel if people could go close to a park. Um, and again, we've, one of the things I know you've been talking about, parks are good for public health in numerous ways, including recreation and spiritual recreation, um, because in, in improvement of the uh, ecological uh, health of the area around the park and the people who live in the communities near the park. And it also helps local economies, which is beneficial to the people who live there. Um, and of course, national parks are good for the climate because uh, large, these parks protect large expanses of forests and wetlands and uh, grasslands and marine areas. And more and more, it's, we know that uh, one of the biggest ways we can fight climate change is to store more carbon in those natural systems. Um, and the way to do it is to protect those systems. And, and that, the other side benefit of that, of course, is it makes for more ecologically resilient ecosystems where we, you have a diversity of the natural diversity of wildlife and wildlife can migrate as habitats shift. Um, that it allows species that, that might be boxed in if you have small areas to, to where they're, they're surviving, you, you can connect wild areas. So you, you're, uh, you have connectivity as well. Um, 
And speaking of biodiversity, um, one of the next to climate change is also the biodiversity crisis. And there's concern that we could lose as many as a million species on from the planet by 2100 if we don't do something. There's discussion of the 30 by 30 or 50 or half earth ideas, saving, protecting 30% to 50% of the earth for nature. Um, and yet, which, and there's growing scientific support for this is not just some crazy outlandish idea. Uh, yet in the US, less than 12% of the US has this level of protection. So we're not even close to even the 30%. Um, new national parks though, that are being talked about could increase the protection to 20% of the US, which is still far from what we'd like to have, but it's a lot closer than what we have right now. And that, it, that could be expanded for quite a bit further if we really got visionary about this. Um, so why national parks? Well, national parks um, around the world are considered the gold standard as it were. Um, and, and that's because there's a unique law that they are managed under that was passed in 1916 which, and the key thing is that the, it's to conserve the scenery, for, but also to provide for their enjoyment, which some people take as a con conflicting mandate, but the key is they have to be unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. So this, this, is, not, this is not multiple use, which we have on say national forests. This is, this is really preservation first and public enjoyment second as a close second and, and assuming that the two work together, which they do. And this is why we've been able to keep these parks. Yellowstone uh, was created in 1872, so it's almost 150 years old. Um, Yellowstone um, is at the heart of the most intact ecosystem in the lower 48 states. And it, it's the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is what the larger area including the park and the areas around it are called, but it's because of Yellowstone that having this core protected area that that, that, that entire region is so uh, intact. And, the, and this is, so now we have a 150 year proven record of protection. There's no other kind of landscape unit or de designation that has been around for anywhere close. The closest thing probably is uh, Adirondack Park in New York at the state level, which was created in the late 1800s, which has also really been a great model, but it's unique because New York is New York and they, there was a lot of money and political pressure from New York City uh, to make this happen. And I'm glad they did, but it's not likely that that kind of a thing is gonna be able to happen in too many other places. Uh, and speaking of Olmstead, it's interesting uh, if you step back a few years, actually before Yellowstone, it, that wasn't just something out of the blue. You had people like Frederick Law Olmsted talking about, uh, he, in fact, even before this, he was concerned about Niagara Falls being despoiled by commercial development and, and uh, all kinds of destructive and ugly and degrading activity with no control over it. And he was interested in the public buying land and protecting it. And uh, they actually created the first state park uh, next to Niagara, along Niagara Falls. Um, and so, but anyway, he uh, then got involved in Yosemite Valley, which uh, you may have all talked about this before, so I won't go into detail, but he was very interested in protecting Yosemite. And there, was no na there were no national parks at the time, so they ended up turning the, the valley over to the state of California. And then uh, and he recommended that basically it be protected like a national park. And, and in fact, the language he used was echoed in the National Park Service mandate several decades later. But the state basically ignored his concerns and that led to John Muir and others pushing to, to incorporate Yosemite into a national park, Yosemite Valley into a national park, which eventually happened in 1890, I believe, it's 1890. <laughs> uh, 
People think that other public lands are protected like national parks. They are not for the most part. Most federal and state lands, that includes national forests, Bureau of Land Management lands, most state lands, and even many national wildlife refuges are not protected from resource extraction and development and other things. So here you have uh, log, clear cut logging in the Tongass National Forest. You have, you have mine spillage from public lands in Minnesota from the Superior National Forest watershed. You have cows grazing. I believe that's Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, which is a Bureau of Land Management run monument, which is not as protected as a national park monument. You have uh, the proposal that was gonna bring uh, uh, hydropower corridor through New Hampshire, which got rejected, but the, the uh, White Mountain National Forest, it would have gone through part of the White Mountain National Forest and the Forest Service was just fine with it. They supported it. You have drill, oil and gas drilling on the lower right, which is right uh, next to Canyonlands National Park on Bureau of Land Management land. And in the lower center, uh, you have the wolf hunting. Uh, and this, this is right outside Yellowstone National Park. So on net public lands, on national forest lands, it's completely legal to shoot and kill wolves. If the wolf, so Yellowstone wolves, in fact, they're protected in Yellowstone. As soon as they walk out of the park, they can get blown away. And they are getting blown away. In fact, there have been some radio collar wolves that have walked out of Yellowstone that were being researched for years and they were killed by hunters. So this is the kind of stuff, national parks don't allow any of this stuff. Um, but the national parks are really poorly uh, distributed right now. And this is, a, this is not a great map it, because it, you can't really tell the size of the parks. And in fact, the, it looks like, you know, there are a lot of parks in the East, but these are almost all very small national parks compared with the ones in the West and in Alaska. Um, so it's, there are only third, there's 63 full national parks right now. And th that means the areas like Yellowstone and Acadia and Great Smoky Mountains and, uh, you know, uh, Grand Tetons and so forth. Those are the areas that you can't hunt, you can't mine, you can't log. They're very strongly, strictly protected. There are other kinds of national park areas um, like national lake shores and seashores, national recreation areas, which not, are not quite as strongly protected, but almost, almost as well. They're still much more protected than those other kinds of lands I mentioned. Um, the good news is there's lots of potential for new national parks. And this is a little hard to read. Um, you probably can't read this, but the, each of these is a potential national park. We've, we, we and other, others have been doing research, looking at potential areas around the country that could be added to the national park system. Um, so we could add 100 na new national parks. That would, so that would be more than doubling the number of full national parks across the country. A lot of these, the, the other interesting thing is, is that there is at least one national park either a new or expanded park in every single state, as well as Puerto Rico, which would get two, hopefully. Um, and in New England alone, uh, here's just a quick list of the areas, but in Maine, uh, there's, there's a uh, Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, which was created by President uh, Obama which is within what we have proposed, our organization, a much larger Maine Woods National Park. And our hope is we could still expand that to, to a much larger park in the Maine Woods. Another area that is inadequately protected is down east Maine. So for even further up down east from Acadia, there's a lot of shoreline, wild co coastal areas and so forth. White Mountain National Forest I mentioned, which is not well protected and the Green Mon National Forest as well. They're both being log heavily logged and, and degraded as we speak. Um, and there's no, no way we're gonna get those areas fully protected without a national park. Cape Cod could be expanded to include a lot of marine areas. It's now a national seashore, which is well protected, but it's not very big. 
the Quabbin, which some of you may know about, which is in uh, central Massachusetts, it's, there's a reservoir in the center. There's a photo right there. Um, but it's surrounded by a huge buffer of forest that's pretty much intact. Um, and it's the largest undeveloped tract of public land in Southern New England. Unfortunately, the state, it's a state reserve, it's being logged for no good reason, just because they want to log everything and, and they claim that it's good for the watershed, but it's actually bad for the watershed. Uh, the Berkshires, part of which is in the Northwestern portion of Connecticut, um, there's a lot of public land that's scattered in various tracts, but those are areas could be better protected. There are now a lot of them are logged and open to other de developments that are not good for the ecosystem. They could also be expanded by buying additional public lands and connecting these pieces. Um, and then Patrog Pocketuck which is a very little known potential park. But this is an area that the Nature Conservancy has looked at and, and has done a lot of mapping and, and surveying. The, the Wood Pocketuck uh, Wild and Scenic River is in this area. It's the, it's the longest wild and scenic river actually, National Wild and Scenic River in New England. Um, and this is the largest, this has the largest tracts of intact forest between New York and Boston. And many people probably think there aren't any intact forests between New York and Boston, but actually it's surprisingly, in the bio, it's very biodiverse for many reasons. So anyway, these are the potential ones just in New England. They're all around the country. There are many other areas. So there are two ways to create new national parks. Um, congressional legislation, the Congress in, puts, uh, introduces a bill, passes it, the president signs it. That's how National parks, uh, full national parks like Yosemite and Acadia and, and, and uh, Mammoth Cave or whatever, those were created that way. There are also national preserves, recreation areas, seashores, a number of other types of park areas, which are generally, which are um, sort of generically called national parks, but they're, they're, they have, they're usually smaller. They don't have quite as much protection uh, mainly because they don't have as much uh, resources, they don't get as much money um, for staffing and so forth, and they're more open to political pressure to allow things that are not so good. Uh, but still, they're way more protected than, say, National Forest or Bureau of Land Management lands. Another way to create national park areas is the president can proclaim a national monument under the Antiquities Act and um, you probably have heard about the monuments in Utah, Grand Staircase, Escalante, and Bears Ears National Monument, which were uh, the first was by President Clinton, and Bears Ears was by President Obama. And then Trump uh, tried to shrink those areas down, way down from what the original acreage was. And those have been that's been reversed by President Biden, um, but. Those are not national park units. They are what this is a, a what I think was a, a misguided approach, which uh, started under Clinton, uh, under Clinton basically, which was to de designate national monuments on Na Bureau of Land Management lands or national forest lands, which are federal lands that we all own. Uh, Bureau of Land Management is all, all in the West in Alaska. Uh, but the idea was, oh, if we uh, give them, if we designate national monuments, it's going to lift the the whole vision of the agencies, and they're going to be more prone to want to protect lands better and have a better uh, vision for the future. Well, it didn't have any impact at all, except for a few few people in the agencies who all these agencies, of course, have some really good people, but the agency themselves are still completely focused on resource extraction. And for example, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in, in uh, Utah allows intense livestock grazing, which directly undermines habitat for other species such as the sage grouse, which, which is a imperiled, probably endangered species. So 
Uh, all national monuments are not under the National Park Service. Some of them are, for example, the Katahdin Woods and Waters, which I mentioned in Maine, that was put under the Na National Park Service and it is well protected and um, is going to, it's, a lot of it was per previously cut over and so forth. So now it's gonna be allowed to grow back and, and we'll have proforestation and a lot of carbon sequestration and biodiversity and it's badly needed for recreation in this region. Uh, so how do you make national parks happen? Well, um, first you have to have proposals for what should be a national park. And in the old days, actually the National Park Service would go out and scout around and um, look for potential new parks. Well, in recent decades, they've been beaten down and their resources have been cut back. So they don't do that kind of stuff anymore. They, they're afraid to stick their neck too far out and get politically bashed by somebody. So they don't do that, basically. Um, on the other hand, uh, they can be, the, the Congress can, can request that they do a study of a potential new park. And that has happened, that continues to happen. Um, and that's something we need a lot more of. We also, nonprofit organizations are doing a lot of research and analysis, which we, we've done. Um, and, and that's how we, do, we found about 500 areas that are potential parks. And that's where this list of the top 100 that was on that map came from. Um, we need to tell, tell the public about these things because most people know they love parks, they love to go to parks, but they don't really know much more beyond that. They don't understand that a lot of lands that they think are protected like national forests are not really protected, uh, at least not, beyond, not to the extent of a national park. Um, we need to get grassroots groups around the country to, to put together their own proposals. And there actually are a number of them right now um, that you probably have not heard of um, because the group either didn't have the resources or didn't seem politically feasible or um, they, the timing just didn't seem right. Uh, right this photo right here is in uh, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area which is a national park area, but um, it's, it has less protection because it was designated to basically service this giant reservoir, Lake Powell, um, which is backed up by a dam. Um, interestingly, and I, I did, I've done a lot of work on this area, and interestingly, the, you've probably heard that there's this, this uh, huge uh, long-standing drought happening in the in the southwestern U.S. and it is it is shrinking these reservoirs on the Colorado River and probably Lake Powell Reservoir is going to be so low that they're going to have to end up draining it and our what we're doing we're proposing and the uh, group I'm working with Glen Canyon Institute's proposing that we redesignate this area as a national park and allow it to restore itself so there's a there the restoration is another key thing that you can do with national parks. It doesn't have to be a pristine landscape like Yellowstone was in 1872. Uh, for example, uh, Grand, uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, almost the entire thing was cut over. Um, and a lot of it was farmland. When the, and when the park was created, a, a lot of it still was open fields. You go there now, you would never know because it's, it's got this big, beautiful, dense forest. So, but anyway, what we need to, to make this happen is, a, is groups need to work locally, but politically, it's much better to work as a coalition. And we're talking to other groups to create a national coalition for parks. And um, the benefit of that is we could, we could work together to create, number one, create public awareness, but also uh, get a, a bill introduced in Congress. An omnibus bill would be probably the best way to do a lot of parks within any reasonable time frame. That's how, how the Alaska Lands Act worked. When, when Alaska Lands Act was passed in 1980, uh, it doubled the size of the National Parks Service system and in, had included wilderness and, and wildlife refuges and wild and scenic rivers all in one big bill. And the, that's in Congress, that's called an omnibus bill where you put together a whole bunch of different 
what would have been individual smaller bills. So we think that act, that could be a really good approach to this. And it also gives you national attention and interest because you're spanning all kinds of different states. So you're getting all kinds of constituencies. And what uh, alongside that, we need the public to pressure Congress and the president as everyone who's paying attention to politics knows right now there's incredible uh, conflict and, and gridlock and so forth. But interestingly, but members of Congress still respond to public pressure. Um, it's not impossible to get them to do, um, to do the right thing. For example, here's, uh, here's a good example of why this is feasible. On the right, there is a chart that Pew uh, Research Center does these surveys every so often. They ask people, what is their favorable versus unfavorable view of uh, federal agencies? And the National Park Service, there you go, it's next to the, next to the US Postal Service, by far the most pop, the second most popular public agency. This has been over and over, year after year after year, this is the way it looks. Um, so the public is very positive about the Park Service. It's not, this is not a controversial agency that people don't like. Um, as I've said, there's a proven record of more 150 years of protection, successful protection, and as well as successfully um, a lot, allowing public access and enjoyment. Um, the, also, national parks can be, uh, as I hinted at, they can be adapted to a particular site. So if you, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be pr pristine wilderness. It can be an area that's all, that's been, that even was once developed. There's even brown fields in, in a few park areas that are being restored. Um, the, as I say, bar, bright partisan support the latest national park, um, uh, New River Gorge in West Virginia was supported by, by Republicans and Democrats. And this is in West Virginia, which is one of the reddest states, but it had a lot of support and it passed and now it's a national park. And of course, the, as, as people get more and more uh, urgent in terms of trying to address climate change, biodiversity and public health and other issues like that, that, are, that uh, we, we need to do something now about, this is a way we can actually do something and it's positive, it'll have an impact and we can get going right now. So anyway, if you are interested in helping or, or learning more, um, there's information here that you can, where you can reach us, uh, Restore the North Woods, that's my organization. It's a nonprofit group based in Massachusetts. We also have an uh, office in Maine. Um, there's some link, our website is restore.org. Um, we also have, there's some articles and so forth you can access. There's a podcast that I, where I talked about this issue. Um, I'd be happy if anyone wants more information, just feel free to email me at kellett at restore.org. I'd be happy to send you more information or links to other things. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, I can see a few people are, um, of clapping. This is, um, yeah, thanks. thank you. Those are all my students. Um, I'm sure they probably have a few questions, and this sure. is a great follow up to the uh, previous speaker in this series, Dennis uh, Liu from the E.O. Wilson Foundation, talking about the importance of trying to identify and protect, you know, half, half the earth. And of course, some pieces are more important than others, which is obviously a main message. You need to know what you need to protect, but um, I can imagine that the places that you've put a lot of work and you and others have put a lot of work into identifying the you know, combined natural and cultural and historic values could be a real backbone to, to getting some traction on, on those issues. Um, I'd like to open the floor to anyone who'd like to ask questions. You can unmute, or if you want to put a question 
in the in the chat, um, you're welcome to do that, and I'm happy to read it for you. So whatever method works best for you. Go go for it. Whatever works. Hi, Michael, this is Amber Pitt. Um, I will start off questions, I guess. Um, so I had a question um, about logistics. So you had mentioned that the American citizens are generally pro national parks. Um, and that is, you know, obviously well documented. However, a lot of the national parks that are being proposed are occurring on national lands that have uh, heavy use and vested interest by fossil fuel and logging industries. And they are not only powerful stakeholders, but have powerful lobbyists and control a lot of um, political decisions in this country. So I'm wondering, how you propose overcoming the hurdles associated with that group of constituents? Uh, well, that's a very good question. And um, I should insert a slide on this in the future. There, there's actually a long history. Every, basically, every national park that was ever proposed going all the way back to Yellowstone had the, exactly the same opposition. Yellowstone, it, the local peoples, there, there were hardly any people living around there at the time, but the, the ones who were there, um, the mostly settled, you know, settlers and so forth had come in at that point, and those people all opposed it because they said, oh, it's, we need to be able to mine and log and graze and so forth. And uh, at that time, they were just overridden because there weren't that many of them. But, but then we got to, for example, Grand Canyon. Everybody now, of course, think so Grand Canyon, everybody loves Grand Canyon. But at, when it was first proposed as a park in the early 1900s, there was vehement opposition from local businesses and local towns. They, they wanted to, to mine it. They wanted to graze cattle. Some people thought eventually they could build a dam or dams to dam it. Um, and it dragged on for years and Teddy Roosevelt ended up designated as a national monument because he, he, the Congress wouldn't pass a law to make it an, a, a monument or a park. Um, over time, of course, people figured out that actually it's way more valuable for as a symbol and, and for tourism and so forth. And today, of course, the Arizona license plate says the Grand Canyon State, and you couldn't take it away from them if you tried. This is the case with every national park. The trouble is you have to get by there's always a vested interest in the status quo because they're benefiting from the status quo. And the trouble is most people are not engaged enough to, they don't have, you know, you've got people whose jobs are to keep doing what they're doing. The average person doesn't have that vested interest. And so you need a lot more people pushing from the positive side, but it can be done. And that's why these parks, that's why parks have been created over time. A good example is that, uh, the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument in Maine, we proposed a national park there in 1994. Um, then a wealthy philanthropist, Roxanne Quinby, loved the idea, started buying land. And then 2012, she proposed that her land become a little national park. There was still opposition, but it was getting softer and softer. By the time we got to 2016, there was enough support and, and the, the opponents, had their arguments showed more and more to be really lame. Um, it was really not gonna have much of any impact on logging or any other industry. Um, and President Obama saw politically that it was possible. He did it and the opposition has totally disappeared. There's no opposition anymore. In fact, there's talk about expanding it. So you had, those are all, those are, Every single proposal you have to overcome that. That's why you need uh, local support. You can't do it without local people who are willing to speak up and support it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that um, history and perspective. I think that's really important. And um, I had a, I have a chat question I wanna read for you. Um, 
that relates to a question I had. Um, the chat question is, how optimistic are you for national parks to be more present in New England? And related to that, which I think is a very important question, given that we are the most densely populated part of the country, um, and we really need these places of refuge. Um, but related to that and your vision of an omnibus bill, I can imagine that, you know, if if there's not local support in one region and the legislator doesn't support it, we just drop that part. You know, we get a grand vision. And then if people say we're not into that, we just say, OK, you know, we'll take you off the list. So I think there's, you know, some flexibility in that vision. Right. And, and it works the other way, too. When you have an omnibus bill, uh, it's the train leaving the station. So uh, states that are wavery, where there are areas that are uh, proposed as a park, they might go, you know, actually, this is, this is our only chance probably to get this to happen. And if, we, if, if we, they pass us by, this could be, you know, the, even, the, even most conservatives uh, in, in politics recognize that the, that if nothing else, the economic value of national parks. And so uh, if they feel like this is, they're gonna lose the potential for new tourism and so forth, uh, there's, a, there's pressure to go along. Now, of course, they've got the logging and other industries pushing the other way, but in reality, those industries are a very small part of the, of the economy. They, they've created this impression as being these huge, huge, overwhelming industries, but actually they're shrinking, they're declining, they're on the wane. Oil and gas, we're going to get rid of it on public lands. I'm, I'm certain about that in the, in the coming decade or two. Um, so in, in a perverse way, people will be looking for an alternative. What's, what's after resource extraction? What comes after it? Are you just going to have nothing in your economy? Uh, so if we have an actual train that's going to leave the station, I think we can. And then there are a number of places where, where there are supportive members of Congress to get it started. So we start with those. New England, here we have a very progressive uh, legislative uh, member, members of Congress in, in the Northeast. And, and most of the governors in the Northeast are pretty progressive, if not very progressive. Um, there's a lot of pushback, but there's more and more interest in in, for example, in Vermont and in Massachusetts and other places to do something to get out of the current extractive industry stuff that's going on. It's not benefiting the, the public. I mean, and it's a very small, teeny part of the economy uh, right now. So I think a lot of it is just inertia that's keeping the current thing going. Uh, but but pe part of it is people don't know that there's an alternative. They don't really know, well, you know, I may not like the fact that they're going and clear cutting the Green Mountain National Forest, but what are we going to do? The P Forest Service won't listen to us anyway. What, you know, what choice is there? Well, there is a choice and we can give it to them. Mm. Interesting. Well, I mean, related to the question, how optimistic are you for nas more national parks in New England? I think there's such a demonstrated need and your map shows such a demonstrated lack of these of these areas and we have to you know get ahead of this you know I think you know from my perspective for the mental health benefits are really critical that people know there's a place that's that's there for them that's that's nearby um Stephen I saw your hand up but then it went down again did you have a question uh sure yeah, definitely. Um, so I might have a couple questions, but one, uh, so there's a foundation in New Haven called Save the Sound. And, uh, and I was wondering if there's any way that maybe the Long Island Sound could be a national park. Um, but the other thing is I'm just, uh, I've just, I've heard a lot about Colorado River drying up, uh, which is hugely important to supplying Western states with water. And uh, I'm not really sure how to pose a question, but I, I guess, um, I mean, as you know, like, so, so the Blue River float, feeds in the Colorado River, which provides uh, millions of people with water. And, um, you know, they have this sort of hundred year old um, kind of agreement to share that water. And I guess I'm just wondering, 
you know, what happens, um, you know, we've got this 20 year mega drought going on and if the river keeps drying up and, and eventually does dry up, I mean, what happens then? Um, so those are my two questions and um, real pleasure to say hello and, and uh, meet, meet you over Zoom and thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, thanks. Well, in ter terms of Long Island Sound, uh, that is not on our top 100 list, but there are a lot of areas that are not in the top 100 list because we were trying to limit it to 100 to start with. And there are some that are easier than others, for example, uh, but actually marine, there's a whole other world of marine or largely marine areas that are not even on this list with a couple excep exceptions. So um, this, this is just a start. There really are lots of other areas that are fully, that totally would qualify. And we need to think outside the box. I think that's the key. The old time thinking of national parks was, oh, it's got to be a giant mountain. It's got to be a huge canyon. It's got to have, you know, huge, huge amounts of wildlife or whatever. But now we know that there are other values. Uh, as Susan says, there's climate, there's, there's, You've got carbon sequestration. Grasslands are super important for climate sequestration. We have virtually no grassland national parks. So one of the things we try to do is to identify areas, prairie and other areas that could be, they're all damaged, they're all degraded, but they, but they could be restored at least to a semblance of nat being natural eventually. You've also got, um, Air, you know, and as I say, marine areas, which have gotten very little attention, there's lots of potential there. So we need to really be thinking, um, this is a solution. This is not like something for, because we want more places to hike or whatever. I mean, that's great, but the reality is it's way beyond, that's part of it, but that it goes way beyond that. And I think that's why, to go back to why I'm, up, I'm uh, optimistic is because these issues are not gonna go away. Climate change is not gonna go away. Biodiversity problems are not gonna go away. Public health and the need for green space is not gonna go away. It's only gonna get more so. And people are gonna look for alternatives and, and solutions. And this is a really important one. And I, I think people are more and more figuring that out. Now to go to the Colorado Plateau and the um, drought, that's all the more reason why we need protected areas like national parks because the current system is not working. They stuck all these dams in there and didn't think about any of the implications. The, you know, the Colorado River and the, going through the Grand Canyon is degraded because of Glen Canyon Dam. There are endangered fish species. Um, and, but we have an opportunity since the, the, with the drought to start to stop wasting so much water because there's huge amount being wasted for example, there, there's, there are farmers growing alfalfa for, for, with Colorado River water. They're cutting it, drying it, sending it to China for cows to be raised for beef in China. Now, if that isn't a crazy, wasteful, idiotic, it, but it shows how there's, the water is too, too cheap and easy to get for those guys and we need to totally rethink the system. And part of that is to restore areas that were needlessly degraded and damaged like Glen Canyon and Grand Canyon. And, and I think it can be done because there just isn't enough water. So this is, again, this is another positive outcome rather than saying, oh, well, what a horrible outcome we can go, geez, we could get some beautiful new restored national parks as a trade-off for being more careful with the water in the West. Yeah, I want to follow up with a comment on the, the water issue. So um, as you know, I was recently the co-chair of the Science and Technology Working Group of the Governor's Council on Climate Change. And we really um, not only tried to talk about the impacts of climate change, but talked about how do we prepare our communities? How do we get all of our systems in the best shape possible? And one of the um, concepts that we focused on was interdisciplinary science and also essentials. And obviously water is an essential and a network of nature is an essential. And um, we're so blessed with plentiful water in New England, but we shouldn't take that for granted. And the best way to protect it is to have natural systems protecting that water, which is what you started your um, slideshow off with. And the two tiny points I wanted to make related to that is 
that was a major motivation to protect the Adirondacks and the Catskills in New York, right, is the water issue. Um, so I wanted to maybe speak about that for a minute. And also, um, was that a value that you tried to put in when you, when you were thinking about the locations of these new national parks? Uh, yes, watersheds are super important. And um, the White Mountain National Forest was another was created for that same reason as well. Unfortunately, it hasn't been managed the way it should be to maximize water quality, but that was the idea originally was to protect watersheds. Um, and on the contrary, we're logging areas that are important like the Quabbin, where it's the water from the Quabbin Reservoir is a part of a system that, that more than 2 million people depend on in, in the Boston area, yet these guys are logging around the reservoir for no good reason. It's just whatever, they just cooked up some bogus reason and nobody knows they're doing it, it's crazy. So the first we can go to the, look at the obvious places where it makes no sense to be degrading the watershed and make sure those watersheds are protected. And then we need to look on a bigger scale and look on, at whole ecosystems and that includes watersheds. Um, so that's, that's really critical. And um, in terms of the criteria, that, uh, that's another slide I need to add. Uh, there were criteria, the criteria for these new parks, among them were uh, vital areas for carbon sequestration. For, and, and for example, the Pacific Northwest, most of the uh, public lands in the Pacific Northwest are open to logging, yet these are the most carbon dense forests in the United States. Uh, um, in, among the most in the world. The Tongass National Forest, the entire forest is proposed to be turned over to the National Park Service and it would end all logging. It's crazy to be logging that forest. There, it makes no sense. Um, another, and, and as I mentioned, grasslands, uh, mangrove forests are really critical for that. The, uh, in the Caribbean, there are a couple areas that we're talking about that would protect those. Um, so carbon and, and then resilience, you need to make sure there's connectivity. Most national parks are too small. Uh, so, so when you get climate change, there are gonna be wildlife that migrate and they're not gonna have any place to go if we don't protect other wild places that they can migrate to. Um, and, then, and then in terms of biodiversity, we most, there've been uh, ass assessments as to you know, how much is protected. And as I say, it's only about 12%. But then you look at what is protected and most of it is in places like the Colorado Plateau and so forth, which are very important, but, but then there are huge parts of the country with virtually no protection. And so part of the goal was to add areas in places that are really have been ignored or, or, or you know, not protected at all, like the uh, Mo Mobile Tensaw River bottomlands down in Alabama, it's one of the most, most important biodiverse um, aquatic ecosystems in, in the country, if not the world. That's where E.O. Wilson lived, grew up in that area. And that's how he learned to love ants and do research. That was his place. And he, he loves that place and thinks it ought to be a national park. It, it, it's just inertia that has kept that area from being a national park. The National Park Service studied it, recommended it. Um, the Southeast has very, is really biodiverse and has, has very few parks. So that was one, another aspect is biodiversity and, and representing different ecosystems and ecoregions. And then another one is, is people in terms of access to parks. And so large city, large urban areas, looking at areas that are within reach of large urban areas. For example, one of them that's proposed is, would be in the Lake Erie watershed. People think of Lake Erie, if they know anything, they think, oh, well, this is polluted, overdeveloped, waste. But it's, it's really important ecologically. Uh, it's got wetlands that have been, you know, degraded and so forth, but there's tremendous potential for restoration in their area. So you've got Detroit, Toledo, Flint, the, all of these communities with virtually no large green spaces anywhere within reach. So what do we do? We just go, oh, well, tough luck. You, you lose, or we go, let's take what we've got. And actually there is quite a bit to work with, with state 
and conservation lands and start patching these together into a coherent whole and create a national park, get national attention and resources to, to go into the, such a project. Um, I think it's totally doable. So those were the major uh, criteria in terms of, of trying, and then in expanding existing areas is a sort of a permutation of this in that a lot, most national parks are too small. In fact, they're all too small, but mo most of them, there's actually opportunity to expand them onto ex you know, adjacent public lands or private lands that would be available. And with, you know, that, that, that's almost like creating a new national park right there by, like Yellowstone, Yellowstone could be quadrupled in size by adding these public lands around it that are not adequately protected. Um, that would protect, you've probably heard about bison being shot, it would protect bison much better, it would protect wolves, it would protect grizzlies. Um, so anyway, that's. Yeah, thank you for that. And just as a clarifying question before we wrap up today, I believe that because we've talked about this briefly before, I believe that this proposal would primarily um, enroll public lands and you know, willing private landowners into the national park, but private landowners who didn't wanna participate in it, it wouldn't have any impact on what they're doing. So if we expanded the national parks and pulled in additional public land, or if we designated an area, it's not mandating anything for any private landowners. Is that correct? Right. If you designate a national park, most national or a lot of national parks include what are called inholdings, and those are lands that are still under private ownership for various reasons. And the the law does not have any impact on private landowners, even within a national park. They can they can do anything they want. Fortunately, most of them don't want to trash their inholding, but if they want to. Um, they can be condemned, which can happen to build freeways and other things, but it's rarely done except like if some, some company owns land in a park and they want to strip mine it or something. Well, then, uh, and, and the, the thing is that it usually only happens when there's a lot of public support for that. Like the public goes, no way, you know, this is crazy. We have, let's, let's buy it. What do I, you know? So but there's, the thing is there's plenty of existing public land there's plenty of land that's available if, if we spend the money, like the Maine Woods. The Maine Woods is mostly owned by giant corporations, by transnational companies, by speculative right, REITS, the Real Estate Investment Trusts. But there's the largest landowner in Maine is a Canadian family-owned company based in New Brunswick, the Irving family. So it's not exactly like down home, Joe and Bill are gonna lose their house or whatever. You're really talking about in, in a lot of these cases, large corporations or, or in other, and you know, if they don't wanna sell, they don't have to sell. But my, my guess is if the money's there, they would be willing to sell. So that's the, the, I think plenty can be done on willing seller basis. There's no need to even get into trying to take people's land or whatever, it's just not necessary. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And um, just a final comment, and then um, I'm going to wrap this up because we committed to trying to keep it to um, about an hour, is one of the things that we recommended as part of the working group for the GC3 was mobilizing more green infrastructure. And I think we need to expand what we think of for green infrastructure, um, not just, you know, rain gardens and, and things like that, but, you know, and what does infrastructure mean? If it's something to protect our communities and we need these values to protect our communities, you know, could some of this money from the Build Back Better, or the infrastructure bill be dedicated to this kind of a, a large vision that could really uh, do so much good across the entire country with one omnibus bill? I mean, I just started thinking that that could be even a mechanism. Anyway, we need to get busy and get the bill on the table. Well, one last thing about green infrastructure is that um, they, they, there is a totally valid rationale and it's gaining more, more interest like mangrove forests, for example, are now seen as huge, important green infrastructure. So protecting mangrove forests, protecting seagrass, 
like the Florida uh, Big Bend is proposed as a national park. That's one of the largest seagrass beds in the US. That is a huge carbon sink. So you're right that we really ought to be tapping, we ought to be cross pollinating on these issues for support and funding. Yeah, great. Well, Michael, thank you so much for this really um, informative um, and actionable um, presentation. And um, look forward to following up and uh, keeping in the loop on how this moves forward. Um, so thank you everyone for joining and um, all of these will be available online, uh, I believe at the Olmstead 200 channel and I'm going to find a uh, place I think if you Google Olmstead and Trinity College you can currently find this series, and you should um, soon be able to find the recordings from all of these talks. Um, so please help me to thank Michael again as we as we all sign off. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.